Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. I came from a background of a state fish and game agency okay. where I was the large carnivore program manager for Louisiana for 28 years. Grizzly bear range expansion is happening literally yes. every day. Yeah. And the, the Forest Service Game and Fish really can't keep up with mm -hmm. where that's occurring. And you can't just keep moving the football in terms of what recovery means. Anything that, that consumes and uses habitat and space at some point has to be managed. That's, right. that's a fact. Yeah. And for some reason or another, they don't understand that. They don't grasp the concept. Mm -hmm. And this everything needs to be saved mentality is not sustainable. Mm -mm. It's not realistic. Since 1949, Ruger has embodied the spirit of hunting in America. Ruger firearms are built to deliver the reliable and accurate performance that seasoned veterans demand and new hunters can trust. At Ruger, we believe that hunting is about more than just the thrill of the chase. It's about the freedom and opportunity that come with it. This is our heritage, and this is Ruger. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut Podcast. We are coming at you guys live from SCI's 51st convention in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm sitting down with my fellow Wyoming resident, Maria Davidson, and you are the SCI Large Car Carnivore Program Manager. I am, and good to be here. It's awesome to be here because we're missing out on some hellacious snow. <laughs> and is, wind. And wind in Wyoming. <laughs> Where in Wyoming do you live? Pinedale. Pinedale. Okay, so I'm in Sheridan, and um, my mom sent me photos and videos this morning, and it is ridiculous, and it was minus 28. <laughs> this is so cold. It's only 80 here, or yeah. 82. I know. Well, and you know what's crazy? I'm like, we, this is our first official winter, like, living in Wyoming, and it is the worst winter in my, the friends that I've known that have lived their entire lives, like, in their memory. Like, they're like, this winter is the worst we've ever had that we can remember. Well, welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and maybe it'll run out some of the, like, people maybe we don't want living in Wyoming. <laughs> we'll keep Wyoming rule, <laughs> right, with well, the weather and the wind. And this is my first whole winter in Wyoming. I moved to Wyoming and got there on Mardi Gras Day because okay. I'm from Louisiana. So okay. I got there on March 1st of last mm -hmm. year so yeah i'm kind of right there with you you're new so we we moved um we bought our place april 1st and then officially like full-time moved may like may 10th and so we're not quite a full year in but um we love it there and I do too. you play such an intricate role on what's going on in the state of wyoming i mean you're you're literally on the front lines of all of this grizzly bear legislation decision making biological decisions. Tell us a little bit of backstory on what you're doing on that front for the large carnivores in Wyoming and for SCI. Well, you know, I work for the foundation. So SCI has two sister organizations. SCIF is the foundation. We do the conservation projects mm -hmm. and then SCI has advocacy, litigation, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm their large carnivore program manager and we're working on conservation projects. In Wyoming, I've got two specific projects that I'm currently working on. One of them is with the Shoshone National Forest mm -hmm. where we, we purchase bear boxes to put out. You know, as you know, grizzly bear range expansion is happening literally yes. every day. Yeah. And the, the Forest Service Game and Fish really can't keep up with mm -hmm. where that's occurring. And so we have bought boxes and given them to Shoshone National Forest so that both resident and non-resident hunters have kind of an easier access to abide by that grizzly bear food storage mm -hmm. requirements that are out there. Mm -hmm. So we went out actually this past summer with the Forest Service to install some of those bear boxes. We had a great time. You know, yeah. I'm working and going out into a back country to install that bear boxes. Suck. Yeah, no, <laughs> Life that, is good. That doesn't suck. You <laughs> should have come. It was great. That's the one time of year in Wyoming where it's actually nice. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, 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 that did not suck. Yeah, yeah. So food storage boxes is one of the projects yeah. that, that we have ongoing and we just did another project where we're giving some 
um, to Game and Fish mm -hmm. to put in some of their wildlife habitat and management areas. So are you putting these food storage boxes in campgrounds primarily? These are in, hunt, these are in, in backcountry hunting camps okay. so that both resident and non-residents, you know, when you go into the backcountry to bring bear proof boxes with you. is extremely difficult. Is, is expensive, it's difficult, so to be bear proof in the backcountry can be almost impossible for some. Mm -hmm. So to have bear proof panniers and bear proof storage for mm -hmm. both your your livestock feed and all of your food and your carcasses, all of that combined can be difficult if not impossible mm -hmm. for some. So to have that already available back there is, is really nice. So we bought 15 last summer, so and we're going to buy another 10 to 12 this, and, and we put them out every summer, obviously. Well, we you have to let me know when you guys do that, because I have mules, and they could use a workout. <laughs> there you go. You'll have to come. Yeah. It's really great. Yeah. Um, so are you assembling these backcountry boxes, so you're bringing in supplies and assembling them, or are they pre-assembled? Well, you buy them, you, you assemble them in the backcountry. Okay, so that's what I would, we yeah. pack them in on mules okay. and then assemble them when we get back there. That is a really incredible program. And so how are you identifying where these boxes are for hunters to, you know, be very specific on where they camp so they can use this resource? Well, the, the Forest Service chooses where they go, okay. and they go in areas that have historical use. Okay. So wh where they know that hunters are already using those camps, and so they already know that there's there's need for them there. Mm -hmm. So we went back and we went through, I guess we went out of Dubois, you yeah. know, up the, up the Dunor drainage, and it was just phenomenal. Although it did rain, I had a, a slicker I've probably owned for 12 years. I used it more in that, in that trip <laughs> in the combination than I have ever used it in its <laughs> lifetime before. So, I mean, it never rains in Wyoming except for... When you want that, to be yeah, on a horse or a mule. Had that trip, but it mm -hmm. was awesome. So are you working with a local outfitter then that's helping you pack this stuff in, or are you guys using your, your we, own stock? How does that work? Well, we have. For that trip, we went with the Forest Service. The okay. Forest Service Has does own, have packers, yeah. but Wyoga, are, Wyoga does partner with this, and they have put out boxes for us, and we use different outfitters depending upon mm -hmm. which drainage we are in, so you know which outfitter we use. But Wyoga is a partner for that project. Wow, so. that's an incredible project. So are these um, like plywood boxes then, or what is the construction? Oh no, no, a grizzly bear would go through. They would, they would, they would, go, they they would, would just squish it, it. Yeah, they would go through plywood. So they're metal boxes, okay. and they they come all of the sides come broken apart, mm -hmm. and then we just put them together with you know screw nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. They and we buy them from a fabricator out of Cody. Okay. So we get them local. And he, you know, they're all, they're really nice. I, I wish I had a video for you. They're, it's it's okay. awesome. It well, is just awesome. Is there somewhere that, like, people listening or watching, if they want to see what these look like? And, you know, where, is there? They, you know what? They can go on our SCIF YouTube channel, okay. and there is an actual link that we did a video of putting those boxes out. It's really a nice video. Yeah. Um, how, how long does it take you guys to to? You know, to take, fabricate to, it. Well, actually, once once you're loading it on the mule and you're heading in the back country, what's your turnaround time on getting these in position? And then how are you like securing them? Are you um, chaining them to a tree or I mean, what's the what's the no no? We just place them out there. Okay. A bear can certainly roll them, they around. Roll them around. They can roll they them around if they choose, but they can't get into them. They can certainly roll them around, but they okay. actually can't open them up and access them. And if there's nobody in camp, if there's nobody using the camp, there's you know, other than the smell of food that the, had in been box. in there in the past, there shouldn't be anything in there. Mm -hmm. They should be empty. So mm -hmm. there shouldn't be any real attractant in there. Um, it depends on where the camp is. Some of them might be two hours in. Some of them might be eight hours in. Yeah. So it just depends on where the camp is. So how many years have you been spearheading this program? Is this your second year then or... This is actually the third year of that project. Okay. I have just started with SCIF. Okay. So I came from a background of a state fish and game agency okay. where I was the large carnivore program manager for Louisiana for 28 years. I retired and started working for SCI because I just love what they do. Mm -hmm. I think they are a great resource for hunters. You know, they, they are first for wildlife, first for hunters. Mm -hmm. Well, what we need to get you is with OnX and have OnX be mapping where these 
uh, bear proof boxes Absolutely. are for people. It would be great. And have them identified so that hunters that are packing into the back country can go in and, and, and have know exactly where they exactly, are. Exactly. Some places sure. that'll give them a little food security. Absolutely. The other project that we have ongoing, and we're going to be doing a lot of it, actually the very week I get back, if I can get back with You'll this. Get with back. this You'll get back. You'll get back. get back. I think it's supposed to stop snowing at some it, point. We only have like 20 one, inches. That's it's fine. Right. <laughs> one, one day it'll yeah, stop snowing. Yeah, one day. <laughs> I, I just ordered and got in 700 cans of bear spray. So we partner with um, Campfire Conservation, okay. Wyoming Game and Fish, and the, the U.S. Forest Service to give away bear spray to promote, you know, safety in bear country mm -hmm. and, and hunters and shed hunters using bear spray, situational awareness, knowing where you are. And we are gonna kind of combine some of that with some training. So I just bought a charging bear simulator Oh my gosh. That I wish it would have been ready and I, ha I would have had it here because it's like on this big remote control robo bear thing that, I, and I've never had a, a remote control truck in my life. So it's going to be interesting. I hope I don't run over anybody. <laughs> <laughs> bear be worse. That's right. So we're going to have our first bear spray giveaway in Dubois and Lander mm -hmm. and Cody just in March, yeah. prior to the sh opening of the shed hunting season in March. So And do that. So I, and I think I, I just went through the hunter ed instructor training in Wyoming and they had mentioned something about um, inert bear spray, like right. where you can practice right actually utilizing bear spray and you know taking it out of the holster removing the safety mechanism and engaging that and do you are you guys going to be doing any training because i i feel like there comes with a little bit of like oh we should all know how to open a can of bear spray but if a bear is really that close to me i might not be cognitively like as sharp as i should be so practicing is really important and, and i don't know how accessible that is well, that's exactly what we're going to be doing. So with this charging bear simulator, it moves really, really fast. Yeah. And so we bought a, you know, hundreds of can of inert bear mm -hmm. spray and, and we will charge this thing at people and they will have to access this inert can and spray the bear before it reaches them. And it'll be so, a very humbling experience because those bears are fast. It, they're fast and people don't realize the difficulty with the, just the muscle memory. They have mm -hmm. no muscle memory for that action. Truly. Well, I have none. I have none. None, no muscle no. memory for that. None at um, all. And, and the, uh, you know, fortunately for me, the part of the state I live in, we don't have grizzly bears yet. Right. But it, yet. Well, right. But yet. it's kind of, it's it's nice to go hiking in the big horns. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yes, I can just, yeah. Just, well, I mean, my husband, I harvested an elk um, this last fall. And this was our, we cashed out my non-resident points and, you know, we we're in the big horns and, you know, we returned to the carcass the next day. We packed out until two in the morning, came back the next morning and got the rest of the meat with a, a big group of friends. And we didn't have to worry about the grizzlies. Right. So that was right. really nice. However, in a different situation, the approach to that carcass would have been, been completely, completely different. different. Yeah. It's a totally different thing. Yeah, and the completely. preparation. I mean, obviously, you know, when you hunt in Wyoming or grizzly um, inhabited areas, it, you, you have to think about getting those quarters 10 feet off the ground and, and securing them in a place that's hopefully away from where your gut pile is and trying to really just minimize your human bear interaction as much as possible. Right, trying to, to keep yourself safe, prevent you from having to kill a bear in self-defense yeah. is is a whole different level of hunting where they don't have grizzly bears mm -hmm. for sure and you know what i have found is local people in wyoming almost prefer to go hunt in the bighorns now mm -hmm. they would prefer to hunt somewhere because they're terrified because they, they are feel fearful and they're they're fearful of you know coming into contact with grizzly bears it happens more often than it did mm -hmm. you know it happens in more areas than it did so if we can do something to educate and and provide information provide them training you know the analogy i use with bear spray is nobody ever goes hunting without ever having sighting in their rifle mm -hmm. never having shot the rifle that they're going to used mm -hmm. to go hunting with and you're counting but, on bear spray to literally save, save your, your life, life. Right. and if you've never trained with it it's it's, it's, it's amazing to me in these training situations the number of people who didn't even know that there was a safety clip on their bear mm -hmm. spray 
they never yeah well if ever you've accidentally ever <laughs> and, like if i have accidentally sprayed bear spray and it is not fun like um when i was going in and out of um some bear bait we got um for black bears and black right. bears will get very um acclimated to people going yes, in and do. out to bait yes they and do. um so i was walking in and out by myself one time and i had the um the safety latch off of my bear spray because there was a very pushy juvenile male and I was by myself and um, I set that bear spray down and I must have just hit the trigger when I was setting it down Oopsie. and I sprayed just a little <laughs> bit it was not nice like even just a little bit of that bear spray was like in your like you breathe it you smell it it's You're, everywhere it's everywhere and you know it leaves uh, like a powdery white you know residue on everything. Yeah. So luckily, I, I was very lucky that it wasn't like catastrophic. <laughs> like <laughs> I didn't like completely, <laughs> just a tiny bit. But I mean, it is, it is. I mean, it is there to protect you. Um, but Absolutely. I mean, obviously, like for me personally, you know, Wyoming is a constitutional carry state. Man, I'm I want a firearm also. But nobody wants to, nobody wants to be in that situation. I mean, we want to do everything we can no. to prevent human bear. Um, interaction that's that's dangerous like that so you know these boxes are fantastic the bear spray is fantastic you know arming people with that so they can be safer in the backcountry is really awesome right you know just like anything else just like walking in a busy downtown or a shady area mm -hmm. situational awareness is everything. everything paying attention is everything and you know lots of people want to have that argument or discussion or debate gun versus bear yeah. spray or whatever and you know I never get into it you no. know whatever you are Choose. comfortable with mm -hmm. you know I am a firearm advocate I, I carry a firearm and that's great I also carry bear, bear spray, spray because I know what bear spray can do I, I believe that it is an effective tool and it bear spray is if you've never sprayed it, it is not like wasp spray. It's not a stream. It mm -hmm. lays down a fog. Mm -hmm. So I know that if I am off that day and I can't hit a bear, I don't have to hit a bear with bear spray. It's mm -hmm. a fog and will be a fog of protection that the bear has to run through. Mm -hmm. And it is, like you said, it's some nasty mm -hmm. stuff. It, and know? the bear spray, a lot of people don't think about too, it has an expiration date. Like this stuff is it, not good forever. That's correct. So if you buy a bear spray and it's been sitting around especially in like a temperature unstable that's correct. environment it will go bad and you know you want to make sure you're checking the label that you're storing your bear spray in the same manner in, in which you would store ammunition so cool dry location that's right that's and, right and monitor you know that expiry date because the last thing you want is to need it and have a chemical and it breakdown doesn't work. i also find it interesting when people say you know it's only been expired a year i think i'm going to keep it and i wonder why would you even risk really? that? It's, 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 it's not very like, inexpensive. <laughs> it's not like you're risking a cake not no. rising. <laughs> what? What? Yeah. <laughs> you could. I don't this think isn't Duncan <laughs> Hines, you guys. <laughs> That's right. I don't think I would risk that. I would go ahead and buy new. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why would you yeah. risk that? So what other, you know, as a as a car large carnivore specialist, what other recommendations do you make for people to be not only situation situationally aware? When you say that, that's such a broad term can you give our listeners and viewers maybe something like more specific on what you know what does that mean what should they be looking for well you know when as you are moving in in bear country you know there are grizzly signs if you see fresh bear tracks many people think that's really cool and it and it can be but you can always choose to alter your plans mm -hmm. you know i have been in situations where i see fresh bear sign and choose well, maybe I will go hunt another trail mm -hmm. that day. Mm -hmm. I will move off to somewhere else. And, and, and I have done that. You know, there, if there's fresh bear sign where you are, go somewhere else. You talked about returning to your carcass with, that you had to leave. Mm -hmm. You know, many people, you know, leave some type of signal that you can see from far away. Leave your carcass where you can view it with binoculars yes. from very far away. Leave something on top of it so that you can see if from far disturbed. away whether or not it's been disturbed. Leave some hunter orange or something on top of it so that you can see whether or not that's been disturbed by a bear. If it's left, 
exactly the way you left it, then a bear likely has not found it. You know, when you are field dressing your animal, you know, try to never ever do that by yourself. Mm -hmm. Have one person doing that and at least one other person. Observing. Always watching out for you, always keeping an eye out for a bear coming probably from up, you know, downwind mm -hmm. where the scent would be Carrying. traveling from the carcass downwind and a bear would be coming from that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, that's happening at a, you know, a more rapid rate where yeah. bears are coming into a kill. So, you know, those kinds of things. And and don't take it for granted that it'll never happen to you because yeah. it it can. Yeah. You know, and and you don't want it to be. You don't want it to be just that one time. No. You know, because that's that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to be prepared and not surprised, and do everything you can to be safe, because they are no joke. I mean, you saw that's right. obviously those two young men that were wrestlers that that's were right. in Wyoming backcountry. You probably know that story well. That's right. How they literally had to fight for their lives. That's right. That's right. And you know it. People, uh, people often ask me, you know, if, if it's a black bear, you know, fight for all your worth. And, and if it's a grizzly bear, play dead. And, you know, as a bear biologist that my entire career, it's difficult to decide what to tell the public in these little short sentences because... It depends that, on the bear's intent. It depends on the bear's intent and it depends on the bear's behavior. For the most part, most grizzly bear attacks are not predatory. They're defensive. So as soon as the bear feels like the threat has been eliminated, they will stop attacking. Which usually. Means, which means playing dead. Exactly. But you always follow that up. But Usually. usually yeah it's like it there's not always one size doesn't fit all no you know and and so it's hard to tell everybody 100 percent of the time you can do this mm -hmm. and so you try to give them as much information as possible mm -hmm. so you know this is what happens most of the time and i can't imagine the wherewithal it takes to play dead with a grizzly bear on top of you but people do it and survive mm -hmm. so you know obviously I think that is the thing to do people also successfully access their bear spray mm -hmm. once a bear has come into contact with them mm -hmm. and use their bear spray mm -hmm. and survive mm -hmm. you know the the data is very clear on that you know I I, I know that I am not the best shot in the world mm -hmm. I also know that kill shots sometimes take time 30 seconds for the animal to actually be dead mm -hmm. i am not sure how much damage a bear can do in 30 seconds but i suspect it's a lot yeah yeah it's terrifying actually yes. how much yeah. damage they can do uh, yeah I, I wouldn't even want to think about it no it is absolutely horrifying and so what is i mean what is the guideline i i know there's not like hey this is if a bear is within five feet of you and they're running at you i mean what's the guideline is there a guideline on hey this is where this is the moment when you should be either grabbing your bear spray or grabbing your firearm. What What is the rule of thumb for that? You know, they say that the bear spray will, you know, the if you look on the can, it will tell you how far it sprays, but the bear is actually moving as well. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the, the bear spray is a fog. And so you spray down, because if you spray up, it's gonna rise a little bit and the bear is gonna go underneath it. And a bear's head is down. So you spray down kind of in a little zigzag and then the bear will run through it. So the bear is running and the fog is going out. So when the bear is still probably 40 to 50 feet out and he's moving at a rapid rate i would spray because the he is going to run through it when it when it comes that close mm -hmm. if it was a bluff charge then he's punished for a bluff charge fine mm -hmm. by me mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. bear made a bad decision yeah. that's still yeah. fine by me yeah. so if you have a bear excuse me <coughs> if you have a bear that is acting as if it's it's has some ill intent be right. prepared Oh, absolutely. And Should we ask, be yelling at these bears like, go away, bear, you know, things like that? What, is, what do you think? What's you know, the, uh, that's another really good question, and people ask it all the time. One of the things that, that I never do, and I don't tell people to do that, if a bear is already defensive, I don't want to escalate an already, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a bad situation. If the bear is already ramped up, there's no reason to ramp it up again. You know, if the bear's already responding defensively, 
making him certain that you have ill intent is is not going to mm-hmm. but I do let them know you know all right bear especially with a black bear and a bear's coming into a predatory attack mm-hmm. if a bear is acting predatory letting him know that you're not going to be easy prey is a good thing to do mm-hmm. then you can ramp it up mm-hmm. but a bear that is already acting defensively for whatever reason you know whether Sounds that bear cubs. right whether that bear is defending you know, her cubs, whether that bear is just an, a nervous Nelly and, and it's defending their space and mm-hmm. reacting defensively of, of its own space or whatever, whether that bear is defending a carcass, whatever mm-hmm. that is, that bear's already defensive. Yeah. You know, you don't have to escalate the situation by, mm-hmm. by over exaggerating and being, you know, loud and aggressive because then you're just kind of feeding into the fight Mm -hmm. you know I do hear that all the time now I don't just completely back down until the bear contacts you and then yeah protect your vitals put your hands over your your head roll into a ball or lay flat so that the bear can't roll you over Mm -hmm. you know you don't want to expose areas that that the bear can harm even more so people Mm -hmm. say lay flat get flat on the ground put your hands over your head Wow, it's just such a yeah, terrifying... Yeah, it would be It's terrible. just absolutely terrifying to even fathom, so... No matter where you pursue the wild, never leave home without Onyx Hunt. Onyx gives hunters the confidence to apply and draw tags in areas they've never set foot in, extending hunting seasons and opportunities. Always know where you stand with public and private land layers, unit boundaries, and more. Onyx can even be downloaded directly to your phone for use when you don't have service. Wherever you pursue the wild, hunt with Onyx. I mean, that's why this prevention and these prevention programs that you're helping put into place are so important. It is important. And, you know, we just entered into kind of a whole new era with the Fish and Wildlife Service coming out with that rule that said that they were going to review it yet once again and mm-hmm. enter that 12 month review period mm-hmm. you know they accepted that petition from wyoming and montana so you know fingers crossed they could choose to delist in the next mm-hmm. 12 months mm-hmm. so it, it's going to be interesting i i'm hopeful mm-hmm. you know maybe that will happen mm-hmm. I, I hope that they turn over management to the state agencies i think it's the right thing to do yeah. i think yeah. it's absolutely and, and the right thing to do especially in these areas where people are living with these bears and you know we're following the principles of the north american model of wildlife conservation that's exactly we're right we're following uh, in, in line with what carrying capacities are for different zones and obviously these bears is especially in wyoming and montana they're not necessarily in the entire state spread out. They're in very localized areas and and because of those capacities, there needs management with them. That's right, you know, bears are not like other wildlife species in terms of carrying capacity. You know, bears can make a living almost anywhere. Bugs and vegetables and grass and plants. Yeah, exactly, you know, so they can they can undergo range expansion and just and just keep going out you know and and you can't just keep moving the football in terms of what recovery means Mm -hmm. you know we had whatever 400 bears and now we had 600 bears and now there's a thousand bears well how many is is enough and then once delisting occurs what is that what is that magic number going to be if if the state has to manage for a stable to increasing population, mm-hmm. does that mean that the population always has to therefore be increasing? You know, it, it's, it gets to be to the point where enough bears is, is just that. A sustainable population is, is a sustainable, but there also needs to be a number to it. How, how mm-hmm. many bears does each state need or want to have and then manage for that number? And then probably not only that, but within what geographic area, Mm -hmm. you know, bears don't always necessarily make the best of neighbors. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't always work and play well with others, Mm -hmm. you know, and they, they, it's probably not appropriate to have them live everywhere. You know, they need to live in the recovery zones Mm -hmm. and maybe not out on the plains. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because, um, you know, wolves in Wyoming fall under three different 
categories. You know, where they're in, in like Yellowstone Greater National Park, they're protected. And then in some areas, they are considered uh, trophy animals, right. which you, you have to have a, a, there's harvest objectives and different types of follow-up that, reporting that you have to do. And then in some zones, they're considered um, just a predator. So similar to a coyote. So in, in like you're talking about in those plains areas, and there's some parts of the state where they don't really want the wolves you know, inhabiting. And so they have different classifications of hunting ordinances even within the proper state of Wyoming, um, and it's regionally specific. Right. You know, and, and if you, you kind of break that down into the thought process that goes with that, <clears throat> that's reasonable. Mm-hmm. You know, it's basically saying it's appropriate for wolves to be here. It's appropriate and good, and we want them here. And then it's appropriate, and we want them here, and yet we're going to hunt them, and we're going to issue tags, mm-hmm. and it's going to allow we're us to, to manage, manage their populations at this level here. And then we don't really feel like we want large populations of them out here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we're going to allow people to take them at will out Mm -hmm. here. You know, but if you look at that, still, there are wolves living in the predator zone. Yes, absolutely. There are packs of wolves living in the predator Mm -hmm. zone. Um, People do shoot them if they can. If they can. If they can. Um, But there are wolves living out there. So the thought process that goes behind that management style, I think, is reasonable. It's something that they could even apply to the grizzly bear in Wyoming and say, okay, maybe not not to the same degree, but have zonal classifications. We'll protect them in this zone. We'll allocate tags in this zone. (coughs) Excuse me. Bless you. You know, know, it's funny. You know, in in a perfect world, you, you certainly could. Boy... Politically, the animal rights groups would go nuts. Oh, yeah. But really, only because they just don't want them hunted anywhere. Period. And they also, I don't think, grasp the whole idea that, that at some point enough bears is just that. It's enough bears. And you mm-hmm. can't have them everywhere because they've never had to live with them. If you, And I, I do make a habit of going to read their comments to try to understand what it is. That they want to protect. What, well, what what they want to protect and what their position is and it's very obvious to me that they just they don't understand the concept of actually living with with grizzly bears when they the call, consequence the consequences of living with grizzly bears when they call the ranchers lazy and and ill-informed and i'm thinking i'm not sure y- y'all really don't understand mm-hmm. and if if you really want to have grizzlies out there, then maybe it's it's all of our responsibility to pitch in and lend a hand, and, and that includes bringing your checkbook yeah. to help the people that actually have to live right. with grizzly bears because there is a there is a financial mm-hmm. cost to doing so, mm-hmm. and and if you don't think that, then you've never actually had to do it, mm-hmm. you know, and it's unfair for just one group of people to have to bear that cost no pun intended Mm -hmm. because everybody else wants them to be out there Mm -hmm. that that's unfair Mm -hmm. and you know i do believe firmly that hunters were the original conservationists Mm -hmm. and and hunters want to have grizzlies on the landscape you know i want my grandchildren to be able to go out and see them so Mm -hmm. i'm perfectly willing to step up and and help you know with that responsibility and, and the other part of that is, I found it interesting when I started doing some of this work, animal rights organizations have really, really begun working in this space. Mm-hmm. One of the things these groups are, are doing while they're participating in all this work is, is they are, are dishing up a huge, huge serving of anti-hunting mm-hmm. message with everything they do. Well, they love to do ads that shows like a mom, a sow grizzly bear with cubs and like hunters pursuing her, which that wouldn't even fit in the sustainable harvest model. Like right. even as it is now with black bears, you're not legally allowed to harvest a sow black bear with a family unit. And right. furthermore, beyond that, they really, really discourage the harvesting of sows. Now it's not illegal, but they set very finite quotas on that. And right. once those quotas are met, exactly. they shut down the entire season. So hunters really, there is a consequence to inadvertently harvesting a sow because they really don't want to do that. They want to make 
make sure that the bear populations are maintained and are healthy and that we're selectively harvesting. And, and a lot of people use this word, oh, we're trophy hunting because they want to spin it to have like the court of public opinion against us but it's truly okay you call it a trophy hunt we call it a selective harvest right we're saying the same things but it's it's a different connotation behind it well it, if you spend any time on on their facebook pages or their web pages they don't really allow the facts inter to interfere with what no. they want to say no. and their narrative never introduces facts no and it, it's frustrating because you know i know i i know i do and and you know, our, our side, I'm bound and determined to make sure that we are the voice of reason. You mm -hmm. know, I hold us to a, not just a higher standard, but to the highest standard. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that our constituency expects it mm -hmm. of us, and I expect it of myself. So mm -hmm. I assume that when they come to us, they want to know the facts, they want to know the data, they want to know the truth. And so that's what they get. Mm -hmm. And if it's not what they want to hear, I'm you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but it is the truth. This mm -hmm. is the data. This is what, you know, uh, the data will support a hunt or it won't support a hunt. It, the harvest will be this. It will be based on sound scientific data. This is what we're doing. And, and I don't sugarcoat it for anybody, mm -hmm. but they do not let facts interfere with what they want to say ever. So what is the next step before reviewing whether we can open up grizzly bear um, selective harvesting in Montana and Wyoming? What's the next step? Where do we go from here? Well, you know, Montana did just do their management plan. I don't know if you saw that, but no. it was a really good management plan and, and we submitted comments on that and I thought they did a really good job. Wyoming has one. It's a 12-month period of time for the Fish and Wildlife Service. I think it's going to I think it's going to push for delisting. I I'm, I'm assuming that they will try another lawsuit. Mm -hmm. SCI will be right there to to fight that if they do. I don't think it's going to happen this time only because of some of the stuff we're hearing at the federal level. Mm -hmm. You know, we're hearing now just like they did with wolves, you know, it went back and forth with wolves at so many different levels so many different times that it, it went the legislative mm -hmm. route which is really as a as a state biologist spending my career that way it's sad to see wildlife managed legislatively mm -hmm. you hate to see that mm -hmm. you know because it shouldn't be it should be managed by wildlife biologists mm -hmm. at, at fish and game agencies but the lawsuits from animal rights organizations have pushed it there mm -hmm. i think that's where you're going to see that i think that's where you'll see the grizzly bear delisting go if it doesn't happen with the fish and wildlife service in this next year mm -hmm. i think that's where you're going to see it go mm -hmm. but when it if it does get delisted i think you will see a, a selected huge lawsuits oh yeah yeah I, well i think they'll try yeah you know and then if they can't sue the fish and wildlife service because legislation prevents it then, then I, maybe they'll try to sue the state agencies. I hope not. You know, I hope that isn't the way it goes. At what point do we say, okay, this is, you know, we have some sort of tort reform on this where they can't continue to f file these frivolous lawsuits that are just slowing up um, ethical and, and science-based management? Where, where, you know, is there a point where we can just put our foot down and say enough is enough, we're done? You know, I, I, I really don't know. It frustrates me to no end. And I, I don't know, maybe I should have been an attorney instead of a <laughs> biologist because it just makes me so yeah. mad. One of our speakers at convention last year spoke, and it, it really spoke to me when he said, you know, they have really almost already won yeah. when they've made the debate and the argument and they've pushed us into a defensive posture because hunting is not a moral or ethical discussion. It's not. I refuse to make them believe that what I'm doing out there is amoral. It's mm -hmm. not. What my son does out there is not amoral. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not. And, and, I ref and somehow or another, they have made us defensive of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that, that just makes me so mad. It makes me mad for me, mm -hmm. but it infuriates me for my son. I yeah, think. as a mother. Oh, yeah. 
It makes me a mama well, that's bear. That's <laughs> one thing I love about the state of Wyoming is that we do have the right to hunt and fish. That's right. And it's enshrined in our state constitution, as is the Second Amendment. And we're a Second Amendment sanctuary. It's one of the reasons I moved to Wyoming. It's a great place to it's live. It's a for great that. place to live. It's really windy, so don't <laughs> think about it, you guys. Yes. And the winters are bad. <laughs> um, but you know th those pillars of of the the actual uh, decision makers and legislators in the state of Wyoming that believe on the same value system that I believe, and here we are, with all of those wonderful things in place, fighting an outside enemy. That's that, right. That does not want us to coexist with wildlife in a manner in which it increases safety and it increases biological security for the for the area. In one of the most natural ways imaginable mm -hmm. to me, mm -hmm. it, or it seems to me, it's mm -hmm. like it's it's one of the most natural things mm -hmm. that can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't understand that. I don't get where they're coming from. I don't I don't understand the concept of. I dislike something, therefore I don't want you to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, if if they want to go knitting, I'm not going to protest their knitting yeah. conference. I don't yeah. get that. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's um, the it's very interesting on trying to discuss hunting anymore when everybody goes to a grocery store and they buy their food wrapped in plastic. They have no idea that at one point somebody had to take that animal's life. Right. And and most kids never make especially urban kids, don't make the association that food comes from an animal. Right. Somebody somewhere had to kill it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And it was alive at one point. <laughs> exactly. And, and the way that we harvest is sustainable, healthy, ethical, and overall good for the environment. Um, and so we, we just give back so much. And, you know, you, you talk about hunters being the first in conservation. And it's true, we're funding conservation through multifacets, of, you know, Pittman Robertson dollars, Dingle Johnson Act on the fishing side. You know, we've got hunting license and tag fees that's funding 75% of state conservation budgets. That's right. But then we have the free market principles that hunters triple down on like SCI. That's right. Where we're coming to these events and we're spending our money and we're, we're, we're putting our money where our mouth is so that we can encourage a, a better environmental condition for wildlife, for wild places, for people. So we have this, um, long-term cohabitants that's improved I mean, look at what's changed since the 1930s when we enacted the north american model it's just night and day difference we're we're species were imperiled in the united states white-tailed deer turkeys elk these these numbers were were rapidly declining and were in a very bad spot and now they're at all-time history highs you don't see hunted species in in trouble no you know it those those aren't the animals that are in trouble and I don't understand the concept of hunters don't care about them at all, then they're not listening. They're not mm -hmm. paying attention. And I think they're not paying attention and they're not listening intentionally because they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear our side. Mm -hmm. And if they did hear, they wouldn't believe it anyway. Well, and then they're all, they instantly go into, well, you can't eat that. Uh, you can't eat mountain lion. You can't eat black bear. Well, I'm sorry. I eat mountain lion and, and black, black bear. bear. <laughs> so, because you don't want to doesn't mean you can't eat them. I mean, it, these animals are very consumptive. And, I mean, even, and I and I brought this up yesterday, and, and people, this one always rocks up major boat, is horses. Uh, my oh husband's Lord. European. And you walk into any grocery store in Europe. And you can buy horse meat. Horse meat is readily sold, readily available in lunch meat, in steak versions. That's right. And we have some really tremendous wild horse populations that can be managed everywhere. I mean, you, we're trying to sell these horses and give them away and find homes for them. And they're extremely expensive to maintain. And and horse meat is, in, in European countries, it is a, it's a, is yeah. a, it is a highly sought after table fare and in... in and I'm not opposed to horse hunting. I hate to like, open that can of worms, but it's true. Something has to be done, and it's all consumable. Bells and whistles and have I, gone off I, everywhere. Well, and I was in Europe this year at Christmas, and they had donkey sausage in one of the markets there. And I am literally... I that have, just sounds funny. I know. They're like, oh, this is donkey sausage. And I'm like, okay, right now I'm torn between... Being Laughing? a mule owner, a carnivore, and I'm also a mule owner, and I'm like, um, oh, I'm torn. I'm torn. But you know what? I just was like, okay, I've tried the horse meat. 
It's not really donkey, for me. Donkey like, sausage. I didn't eat it. They're like, well, it was an old one. I'm like, I'm okay. <laughs> like, it's, this isn't an emotional thing. It was just like, okay, <laughs> I choose not to eat donkey. It's not for me. But, I mean, they're selling this stuff around the world. Horses, donkeys. I mean, it's, That's it's, funny. it is really like, I have video of the donkey sausage. I was like, I'm mind blown, right? Um but it, it is it, it it all goes back to <laughs> <clears throat> managing all of these resources we have. You know, anything that, that consumes and uses habitat and space at some point has to be managed. That's right. That's a fact. Yeah. And for some reason or another, they don't understand that. They don't grasp the concept. Mm-hmm. And this everything needs to be saved mentality is not sustainable. Mm-mm. It's not realistic. No. It's not sustainable, it's not realistic, and it's not ecologically sound. And, uh, no, the, correct. All of the above. All of the above. All of them. And and if they thought that were so, then they need to get their checkbooks out and mm-hmm. write big, 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 big mm-hmm. checks. And it's, none of them do. And it's interesting because most hikers, a lot of hikers, you know, they lace up their hiking boots and they go out and they want to see all these wild animals and they want to hike around and experience these beautiful places and they want them pristine and and they want fences you know, old fences torn down and they want, you know, good water sources for wildlife and to enjoy. And, and they're not contributing to that. Oh, no. Hunters are contributing to that. And it's like, man, every time you lace up your boots, you should thank a hunter. Every time you lace up your boots, thank a gun owner. Every time, right. you know what, because these are the people that are, are on the foref- on the front line of conservation. We're funding the conservation efforts that are happening throughout the United States and for that matter, worldwide. Um, and and we're doing a darn good job, and we just need a little room to breathe to help manage the, the couple of these key species that we're being handcuffed on. If, if they started funding at the same level today, they could never catch up. No, no. They could, they could never catch up. I don't, I don't know what it would take for them to actually meet what what hunters fund I, don't, I can't even imagine what that would take no. but yeah I mean now that now that you live in Wyoming you can see the head butting that goes mm-hmm. on you know I live in Pinedale right there at the base of the Wind River Range so it is a hiker's destination paradise yeah. and so I, I see all of that head butting mm-hmm. with the outfitters and people going in there on horseback mm-hmm. and you see that at the trailheads and it is so ugly. For some reason or other, the non-resident hikers that come in there are in so incensed at the people with horse trailers and because the horses poop on the trail. I don't know what that's all about. It's insane. It's like, I think the outfitters and the all of that, they built those trails, guys. That's right. That and they maintain that you're, hi- that they you're, maintain that, that you're hiking on. That's right. And they go in there with their horses and they maintain those year round. So That's they right. Have access. Can't we all just get along? Let's all get along. Like, can't That's we right. all just get along? Let's all get along. Let's find some good management tools and, and continue to manage these large carnivores. And I can't thank you enough for everything that you're doing in the state of Wyoming and leading the charge on and... And I really definitely want to keep in touch on this when you guys start putting some of those boxes out. On, oh, you're um, going to have to come. You should come do a bear spray training I, with well, us. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Bear spray training. And then bear I, have, spray training. I have mules. I can come and, and ride in even if I'm, you know, just tagging along. And Oh, we're going to we're gonna do, do it. We're going to be in Cody, Dubois, and Lander in March. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. And that's for the bear spray training. Yes. I'll chase you around with the robo bear. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> uh, I'm running. <laughs> Actually, the Lander one would be fun because Kafaro International, they just moved their corporate headquarters to um, Riverton. And um, I would... Someone told me that. Yeah. And so I would actually... I could make that a really fun weekend. <laughs> We're going to do that one <clears throat> soon, like March 17th and 18th mm-hmm. in Lander and Dubois. Okay. okay. Well, we'll I'm going to have to when, call me. When we're offline, we'll, I'm going to yep. put these in my book and we'll talk it's about gonna it. It's going to be fun. That would be fun. And um, is there anything else you want to share with people on what you're doing or things to be aware of or, or kind of final thoughts? What was that other project we were going to do? Give me a second. I'm, being, I'm getting so brain dead. 
Well, is, is we, the heat it's in Nashville? Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know about you, but it I'm, might be the alcohol. I haven't had a night where we haven't been in before midnight. <laughs> so, and actually, we were we've been out later tonight, and we actually went to the gym this morning. And I'm like, oh shut oh, up! Oh yeah, we're. I really try to maintain some level of health as I poison myself at the same time. <laughs> You're sweating out. <laughs> I'm the- like sweating out. <laughs> but I'm really. I don't really. You know, I'm not much of a drinker. So, but, so for me to have a couple in the morning, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Oh, me either, yep. two is like my oh, limit, yeah, so yeah, if yeah. I have like four, I'm then like... Then you're really done. Oh my God. Oh my <laughs> brain God. brain fog, and we don't know I what we're talking yeah, about. I can't think, I can't think. I think, I think we covered it. That's, That's what good. we're going to be doing in okay. Wyoming. That's what we're... I've kind of got it set in mm-hmm. Wyoming. Well, I sure appreciate you taking the time to come down and podcast with us this morning, and um, all of you, thank you for tuning in. If you want to learn more about what you're up to, SCI and SCIF both have yep. Instagram, Facebook pages. If you go on um, safariclub.org, tons of resources on that website, and um, you guys, if you're in Wyoming, just get online and, and follow SCIF and see locate one of these bear spray um clinics that's right we, we just put the press release out we want you at them we want you to attend out. them and I'll, i'm going to promote that because i, I got to put some steam behind yep. that and um, you know we all need to be safe out there so thank you all for joining us and we'll be bringing you some more podcasts later today from the 51st annual national convention here in nashville thank you thanks christy thank you for listening to the wild and uncut podcast If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.